Okay, good morning. It is now Friday on finals week, so it is too late to take the final, um, which sadly means for the few people who didn't take the final, they just can't do it now, um, which means it is now a good time for me to provide feedback for the final. I'm going to go through and um, look at each question and tell you why the answer, the right answer is right, why the wrong answer is wrong, things like that. I'm sorry I didn't give you more heads up. Um, I'm sure some of you may have wanted to be here on this meeting to ask specific questions, and hopefully some of you might show up because I did just post the announcement before I started the video. Um, um, anyway, I'm going to make this video. I'll share it with you. If after watching the video you still have questions about some of the questions about the questions, let me know and I'll see if I can answer them. Uh, before I get started, I'll remind you. Uh, there is a way to speed these videos up so you don't have to watch it as slow as I'm talking. You can, you know, get it through much quicker. And I forget exactly where on the screen it'll be, but maybe either this corner or this corner. Either way, you'll see a little icon. And if you click that icon, it'll be a little another video that shows you how to speed up videos just in case you don't know how to do it. So anyway, let's get started. First thing I need to do is present my screen. All right, here we are looking at the questions for the final exam. Um, obviously, the, the, the semester is over, so good on you if you're watching this because you are obviously doing this simply for the sake of learning um, and not for anything to do with your grade or preparing for an exam because there are no more exams. So anyway, here we go. Let's get into it. First question, genetic drift is caused by what? I've said this a million times. I was hoping people would get it. I was hoping this would be one of those easy questions. The answer is simply chance. Genetic drift is caused by chance. So remember, when we talked about evolution, there's all these different types, types of evolution. There's natural selection. There's genetic drift. There's the founder effect. There's the bottleneck effect. Um, gene flow. All these different things are different types of evolution. Genetic drift was just simply one type of, um, of evolution, which is why the answer is, well, Anyway, um, so the answer to this is chance. So these are, it wasn't, you know, um, I think I used the, the example of chin dimples in humans, right? There is no evolutionary advantage that we know of of having chin dimples. So maybe if we were to look at the entire human population right now, there might be, I don't know, 65% of all humans have chin dimples. And then maybe if you were to look at humans in 100 years, maybe, I don't know, 54% of humans would have chin dimples because that would be evolution, right? That would be a change in the gene pool, a change in the alleles, not because there was any advantage of having a chin dimple because that would be natural selection, just by chance, right? So anyway, that's the right answer. And as I go through these and give you the right answers, I'm also going to double check and make sure that I have these things marked down correctly. You know, actually, I shouldn't say double check. I've checked it before. So this is more like quadruple check. So I'm looking at these again to make sure I have the right answers correct. Uh, marked down correctly that way um, to ensure that your grades are correct. Anyway, that's the answer. Chance. Obviously, I already discussed natural selection, so you know why that's not the answer, right? And natural selection is just a different type of evolution. Um, a large gene pool would actually minimize the effects of um, genetic drift. And environmental variation, that's no. Anyway, next question. There's a population of rodents that ranges from bald to fluffy. So try to picture that in your brain, right? Try to imagine like a an axis, an x-axis that shows these different um, rodents. On one side, on one extreme, you have very bald. On the other extreme, you have very fluffy, all right? So that's what we're dealing with. At one point, most of the population is slightly hairy, right there between fluffy and bald. And again, I wish I could draw on the screen so you could see what I'm talking about. But again, imagine very bald on the left very hairy and fluffy on the right, and then right there in the middle, slightly hairy, right? And I'm saying most of the population at one point is slightly hairy. So again, and hopefully this rings a bell, and this reminds you of what the discussion we had in, in, um, in lecture. But imagine a bell curve, right? So most of the population is right there at the top, or excuse me, right there in the middle. Most of the population would be slightly hairy. Very few would be very bald, or very few would be bald, very few would be um, very fluffy, right? Most of them are right there in the middle. So that's what we're starting with. So then the question is, which of the following is an example that results from directional selection? And all you need to know from directional selection is that you're moving towards, towards one of the extreme phenotypes. And in this case, 
bald is an extreme phenotype and fluffy is on an is an extreme phenotype so if it's directional selection it's going to one or the other right so let's look at the choices um the population changes in such a way that there are fewer slightly hairy individuals so fewer in the middle all right so we're on the right right track there but more fluffy individuals yes that would be directional selection in that case it would be dire the direction would be to the right the way i've described it right so we're going towards the extremely fluffy phenotype Mind you, if this said the population changes in such a way that there are fewer slightly hairy individuals, but here's where it's different, more bald individuals, that would also be the same. That would also be directional, right? Because you're going from, you're going to the extreme phenotype and that would be directional. So that is why this is the correct answer. Let's look at the other options. The population changes in such a way that there are fewer fluffy and bald individuals, but more slightly hairy individuals. That is incorrect, right? So if you're getting, in that case, you're getting rid of the, you're getting fewer of the extreme, but more of the middle. And that is stabilizing selection, right? When you get rid of the extreme phenotypes or get fewer of the extreme phenotypes, but get more of the middle phenotype, right? That would be, um, good grief, stabilizing selection. Next choice, the population changes in such a way that there are, Oh, there we go. Fewer fluffy individuals, so fewer of the extreme, um, but more slightly hairy and bald individuals. So that one would be, um, right, that was just one I kind of made up, right? That's not necessarily not necessarily anything um, that we've described. And then, of course, the, the entire population increases. That has nothing to do with that. So anyway, yes, that's the answer, and that's why that's the answer. Next. If the frequency of one allele in a population is 0.4 in a population with two alleles, meaning that's either this or that, um, what is the frequency of the al alternate allele? And remember, it all has to add up to one. Or if we were doing it in decimals or percentages instead of decimals, you would say it all has to add up to 100%, right? So in this case, if 0.4 is one allele, then the other allele has to be 0.6 right? Because 0 0.4 plus 0 0.6, that equals one, right? And again, if this was a percentage, if I wrote it in a percentage, um, which I thought about doing, but the way it's written here is the way it was written in the study guide and the way we discussed it on the exam review. So I left it that way. Anyway, if it was percentage, if that would be 40%, and then this would be 60%, that would be the answer. Um, so yeah, that is the correct answer to that. Next, 3D printers can create so many things, but they can't create alleles. Looking at the following choices, tell me what can. In other words, this question is asking what creates alleles? Where do alleles come from? And remember, alleles are alternative versions of genes. So the answer is mutation. That's it. It's simply mutation. Because um, remember, a gene, it's just a bunch of, it's a code, it's, mm -hmm. right? It starts with the DNA. It's the A's, the C's, and the T's, and the G's. And it it's a code on how to make a protein. So if that mutates, you're going to have a slightly different version of that original gene, right? And that is an allele. A different version is an allele. So the only thing that can create an allele is mutation. Now, sexual reproduction can help shuffle the alleles that are already present. Um, natural selection takes advantage of that and chooses the most advantageous allele. Um, genetic drift, as we learned earlier, is just by chance. So, you know, genetic drift in in genetic drift the allele frequencies change by by chance but they certainly don't create alleles um and then i made a word up which was chromatization wait chroma chromatization anyway it's a word i made up so if you'll notice this question was worth two points so basically you got two points if you got the correct answer and then you even got one point as long as you chose a word that we discussed and didn't choose this word that I completely made up. And some of you did choose that word, in which case you got zero credit. Um, moving forward. Only one of these things is considered a fossil. Which is it? I was hoping this was easy. People missed this. Um, similarity between four limbs, blah, blah, blah. No, that's, uh, that's evidence of common ancestry. Bones of extinct llama creatures. There you go. There's your key right there. We're talking about bones. We're talking about something that's extinct. So the answer is bones of extinct llama-like creatures. Um, the distribution of predators, no, because you're you're looking at things that are alive. That's not a fossil. Um, DNA sequences, no. Again, 
that's not a fossil. Um, and then, of course, I just threw in something completely odd and off the wall, the original Nokia cell phone. But anyway, that's that. Let's move forward. The similarity of the embryos of fish, frogs, birds, and humans is evidence of what? And I kind of set it up there, or I did say it up there. I just used a different example. And the answer is common ancestry. The fact that when you look at the embryos of fish, frogs, birds, humans, basically vertebrates, when you look at them, um, they look very similar. And that is evidence of common ancestry. Um, and then I threw, obviously, mitosis is way off. Hopefully you didn't choose mitosis or a conspiracy theory or really, really hope you didn't choose conspiracy theory because at least mitosis is something we talked about, just never in the context of um, evolution. So anyway, moving forward. Wow, that population of Christmas elves is at Hardy Weinberg equilibrium, which means what? So in other words, this question is asking you what what does you know, what is the Hardy Weinberg equilibrium? So let's look at the answer here. Or the choices the population is subject to natural selection no because hardy weinberg equilibrium means it's not evolving it's not changing at all um and if it was subject to natural selection it would be changing let's look at the other wrong answers genetic drift is occurring no because again if genetic drift is occurring then the gene pool is changing those percentages of alleles or the frequency of, of alleles that's changing therefore it is changing therefore it is not at hardy weinberg equilibrium uh, gene flow in and out of the population occurs. Again, that is evolution. That is a type of evolution. So no, that would not be at hardy weinberg equilibrium. Um, and then the population is growing at a rate equal to the rate of photosynthesis. I just threw that in there as a complete nonsense, right? That makes no sense. And I don't think anyone picked it. I hope not, because that, that sentence just makes absolutely no sense. But anyway, the answer is the population is not evolving. And again, I want to give you some advice on taking multiple choice exams throughout your college semester generally speaking if you can find one thing that's not like the other generally speaking that's might be the right answer at least if you're guessing right if you're going to guess anyway you might as well have some sort of method to your madness so look this option is evolution in action this option is evolution in action action this option is evolution in action this is saying population is not evolving right so this answer is the opposite of the other three um the other three choices of course then there's also this one that makes absolutely no sense but yes so that is the reasoning that is why this is correct and the rest of them are not correct next question you know natural selection requires variation but where does that variation ultimately come from so where does the variation from natural selection ultimately come from this is basically re-asking the question that I asked you earlier because that those variations we talked about alleles, right? Different versions of genes. So the answer is mutation, right? Gen mutation is where the variation comes from. And that variation is um, the alleles, right? The different versions of genes. Um, of course, genetic drift, that's just the change, right? So you have the variations and the percentages of those alleles are changing. That's gen by chance, that's genetic drift. Geographic isolation, that kind of helps or sometimes results in speciation, which I don't have time to talk about again right now, but that's the wrong answer. Crossing over has nothing to do with this discussion. Well, has little to do with this discussion. And of course, rolling the dice, no. So anyway, the answer is mutation. Moving forward, wow, that population of reindeer is evolving via natural selection. This leads to what? Or this will lead to what? So basically, this question is asking, natural selection will lead to what and remember that was a question as all these were on the study guide a question that i gave you answers to they're the answer to when we did the final exam review anyway what will natural selection re lead to let's look at the choices increased genetic variation among the reindeer sometimes it does lead to that but not necessarily always a population that is better adapted to the future environment no we don't know that there could be an explosion a nuclear explosion tomorrow. Maybe the, the future environment is a is a wasteland. Who knows? We don't know what the future holds. So no, that is not the answer. A population that is adapted to its current environment. That is the answer. That was the answer on the study guide. That was the answer on the final exam review. Written just like that. I didn't, I don't know if I remember correctly, I didn't change the wording at all. Um, an increased an increase in the size of population. Eh, not necessarily. It could happen, but remember. 
generally speaking, populations are at carrying capacity, right? Right where they need to be. So if you have a higher population, that's not necessarily a good thing. Um, and that's a whole different discussion. Anyway, decreased genetic variation among the reindeer. Not necessarily, just like not necessarily increased. Um, and then, of course, I just threw out here something that makes absolutely no sense, which is a happier Santa Claus. I guess it makes sense because we're talking about reindeer and it's Christmas time. But yeah, so the answer is a population that is adapted to the current environment. Next, you're home between semesters and your little cousin asks you what natural selection is. Which of the following replies is correct? So basically, this question is asking you what is natural selection? And these options were options. This, or this was a question from your study guide that we discussed in the final exam review. So let's look at the choices. The production of more offspring that can survive in a given environment. Now that is a key, right? That's one of those things that you need for natural selection to occur. So let's move forward, keep that in mind. A process in which organisms with certain inherited traits are more likely to survive and reproduce. Let's read the whole thing here. Then individuals with other traits. Boom, that's the answer, right? That's natural selection. It's all about different traits having an advantage and those traits being passed along to the next generation because that advantage helped um, the organism to survive and pass along the genes that are responsible for that advantage. So that is the answer. Um, so again, remember the first one was close, but not quite because you do need an overproduction for natural selection to occur, generally speaking, but that is not what of uh, natural selection is. Um, the next next choice, a process in which changes in gene frequencies result from evolution. No, not necessarily, right? Because the reason this answer is wrong is because that's too broad. Because remember, as I've already stated already in this video, there are different types of evolution. There's natural selection, sexual selection, gene flow, genetic drift, founder effect, all that stuff, right? Um, so any of those could fall under this category. And that is why that answer is incorrect. Next, the evolution of a population of organisms. Again, too broad, right? Because if a population of organisms evolves, again, it could be natural. It could be natural selection, but it also could be actually it could be artificial selection. It could be gene flow, sexual selection, founder effect, all those things that we've already discussed. Um, and then finally, one of the off the walls one that I put on there. It's when you choose organic produce at the grocery store. And luckily, no one got that one, if I remember correctly. Next question. Let's consider the Hardy-Weinberg formula, which is P squared. Uh, excuse me. Let me reread this. Let's consider the Hardy-Weinberg formula, which is P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared. Regarding the middle term, which is 2PQ, right? Pronounced 2PQ, just to make sure you got the right one. What does it represent? So what does 2PQ represent? And I chose that one to make things easier because P squared and Q squared, those are the um, homozygous dominant and homozygous recessive. And depending on the source you look at, you know, sometimes P squared could be the dominant one. Sometimes it could be the recessive. And I've seen that on different sources. So to keep things simple, the only thing that's never ambiguous is 2PQ. 2PQ is also, as always, the frequency of heterozygotes. So that is the answer, frequency of heterozygotes. Um, then we have here the frequency of the dominant allele. If you chose that one, you lost extra points. And here's why. When we're talking about the Hardy-Weinberg formula, when we have P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared, right there, because there's three different options, so to speak, right? That tells you that we are talking about um, genotypes here, right? We're talking about homozygous dominant, homozygous recessive, or heterozygous. We're not talking about alleles because remember, in all the examples we've talked about for this, there's only been two alleles. There's been the dominant allele or the recessive allele. And that's where you would have P plus Q equals one, right? That's the different Hardy-Weinberg formula. So if your answer had anything to do with alleles, then you lost points because we're not talking about alleles. We're talking about genotypes. Um, so yeah, if you guess homo feder <laughs> frequency of heterozygotes, that was correct. If you guessed frequency of homozygous dominance, you at least got partial credit because you were on the right track. Um, at least it was a phenotype. And if you chose frequency of dominant allele or, God forbid, you chose frequency of bowel movements, 
um, then you you just got zero credit. Moving forward, which of the following is not a lie? So in other words, which of the following statements is true? Natural selection works for minimum wage and likes it. What? No, that's just some garbage I threw in there. And unfortunately, somebody picked that. What? I'm just, you know, I just do these things. You should be familiar with how I write exams by now. Sometimes I just throw out some garbage, and that is one of those garbage choices. Um, natural selection works on heritable traits. That is correct answer, right? If it's inheritable, natural selection doesn't work on it. It has to be something that you can inherit. Here's one that sadly people got wrong, and this is the choice they got they chose. Many people chose this, and it upsets me because I've emphasized this so much throughout the semester. Individuals evolve through natural selection. No, 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 a thousand times no. Individuals do not evolve. Populations evolve. Think about the moth lab you did. There was white moths and there was dark moths. Not one single moth changed from light to dark or dark to, to light. Dark to light or light to dark. Anyway, no one single moth changed colors. What happened is the amount, you, they, you look at the entire population. The entire population started off and had a bunch of light moths with very few dark moths. And over time, those light moths were picked off and eaten by the predators. And you were left with dark moths, right? The population changed. Not one single moth changed. Very important concept. Um, I should have made that worth more points. So you lost more points for answering that uh, because that is just a very, very wrong answer. And I've been saying that throughout the semester. Um, anyway. The other option is individual organisms evolve structures that they use the most. This one's doubly wrong because, again, we're not talking about individual organisms, right? Only populations evolve. And then this part, structures that they use the most. No, that was a Lamarck idea, right? Lamarck thought that if you used a structure, then they would get passed along. Like he thought that's how giraffes got tall because they stretched their necks. So because they were constantly stretching their necks, their offspring had slightly stretched necks. And then they stretched their necks when they were eating. And then their offspring had slightly stretched necks, so on and so forth. So no, um, really, none of all of these answers are horribly wrong. Uh, natural selection works on heritable traits is the only remotely correct um, answer. Anyway, moving forward. Dar uh, what did Darwin say was the mechanism of descent with modification? That's just a simple I mean, it's written in an odd way and spaced oddly, but it's a simple statement. And we've said it a few times. And again, it, well, everything you've seen here was discussed on the final exam review. But the answer is simply natural selection. Natural selection is the descent or excuse me, is the mechanism of descent with modification. It's that simple. Um, anyway, yep. If I was about to say this one was worth more points because I came up with this word uniformitarianism. So if you guess that, you lost extra points because that is nothing we discuss. It is something I made up. Next, basically, what causes gene flow? Oh, I was hoping this was an easy one because I kept giving you the hint when we discussed it in lab, when we discussed it in lecture, when I discussed it in exam reviews. Gene flow, it's in the name, flow. Genes are flowing. Where are they flowing? Well, they're flowing between populations because there's migration. So it's that simple. That is the answer. Gene flow happens because of migration. And I was really hoping that was an easy one, but it's not. And hopefully you didn't. At least these other things have to do with that. Hopefully you didn't say transcription because that is just that has nothing to do with this discussion. All right. There's a population. Wait, before I move forward, let me say this. I kind of mentioned this at the beginning. If you're watching this video, this is awesome because, you know, there's no reason I didn't say anything about extra credit. Um, the semester's over, right? So you have no reason to believe that you would get extra credit for this. But I'm changing that up. And I wanted to put that towards the middle of the, uh, or toward uh, farther into the video as opposed to the beginning. So if you're watching this, yes, I'm going to provide extra credit. And I'm going to do this the same way I would do some of the lectures. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you some keywords throughout the video. Um, and then if you finish the video, Send me an email with those keywords, and I will add a maximum of five points towards your final exam score. Um, and I said a maximum, and here's why. I'm not sure. Basically, the more people that send me that email, the fewer 
points it's going to be worth. What I'm trying to avoid here is, you know, John Doe watching this video, writing down the words, and then emailing his friends and saying, okay, hey, email the professor, give him these words, and you'll get five points of extra credit. What I'm trying to do here is, the, again, the more people that send me that email, the fewer points it's going to be worth. I don't know how how much of a deduction I'm going to make yet. But, again, send me the email. <laughs> don't share it with your friends because the more people that do it, the less points you're going to get. So, But you know what you could do? Well, nah, never mind. Let's just leave it at that. So, anyway, that being said, the first word in the sentence is going to be... Um, Barbell, you know, like the thing you would work out with something with weights. The ne- the first word is barbell. Anyway, moving forward, we're going back to this population of rodents again. We're starting with the same thing. You know, it ranges from bald to fluffy, and then you ha- in the middle you have that slightly hairy, and most of the population is right there in the middle. Again, we have that bell curve. We're starting with the same thing. So, starting with the same population, which of the following is an example of directional selection? Oh, look at that. That is actually a typo on my part. So you got the same question twice, which makes things easier for me right now because I don't have to explain all these answers because I've already done it, but I will check to make sure I have the right one marked down. Yeah, the population changes in such a way that there are fewer slightly hairy individuals, but more fluffy. So again, in this case, it was directional towards the right, um, towards the fluffy extreme phenotype. Moving forward. There's all kinds of tools that measure things, Uh, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Basically, what this is asking is relative fitness measures what? What is relative fitness measure? And the answer is simply relative reproductive success. Now, that being said, not let me see. Did I give you extra credit for this? No. Anyway, if you chose physical health or longevity, you're kind of on the right track, right? Because if you have good physical health, if you have longevity, you are more likely to reproduce, right? So at least you're on the right track. But all that being said, you know, you, there might be some creature that's born that has something, some, something that gives it an amazing survival advantage. Um, So it just lives forever, not forever, but you know, a lot longer than its counterparts. But let's say it also has some mutation that makes it sterile. So it doesn't matter that it has all these awesome advantages that allows it to outlive its competitors. If it can't reproduce, then that's not natural selection, right? Because those genes aren't going to be passed along. So yes, you were on the right track if you chose these first two, but the, the, the best answer, the only real answer is relative reproductive success. So how much is one organism reproducing compared to the other organisms in its population? Uh, population size. No, it doesn't measure population size. That's, but at least the word population is in this discussion. So, hey, uh, I guess that's not too bad if you uh, chose that. And then bicep circumference. Again, <coughs> excuse me. As you know, I like to throw out off the wall options, and that is one of those off the wall options. And off the top of my head, luckily, nobody um, chose that one. Moving forward, all of the following except one is required for a little thing we call natural selection. So basically, you're looking at a list of things that are required for natural natural selection. All of them except one, right? One of these things is not required. Um, and you have to, excuse me, I, I know this is unprofessional, but I wasn't planning on making this video anyway, so I'll just go ahead and let you know I have an important text that I'm responding to right now. All right. Anyway, moving forward. Uh, So again, we have a list of things that are required for natural selection. Which one is not? Let's look at the choices. Differential reproductive success. Yeah, that is definitely required for natural selection. We just talked about that earlier when we were talking about relative fitness. Overproduction of offspring. Yeah, because that's what that's what causes the struggle to survive. The competition, right? If everybody's just living fat and happy and there's no competition, then there is no advantage to having this gene or this allele over that allele or this phenotype over that phenotype, right? There's no advantage. Therefore, there, there's no, nothing for natural nature to select. Um, genetic variation. No, we need that genetic drift. There's the answer, right? Genetic drift is not required for natural selection. As a matter of fact, again, like I've already said, even today, 
Natural selection is just a type of evolution. And another type of evolution in a completely different category is genetic drift. That's just a change in the gene pool by chance. So the answer is genetic drift. Next, in most developed countries, overpopulation growth rates, over, excuse me, in most developed countries, overall population growth rates are doing what? Um, and the key here is the ED, right? So we're talking about developed countries, not developing countries. They're developed, like where we live in the United States of America. Um, Populations are high, so the population is growing rapidly. Excuse me, growth rates are high. No, that's not us. Um, again, not us. Our growth rates are not high. Here we go. Um, grow, growth rates are near zero, so the population size is fairly stable. There, that's the correct answer. Um, and then the other options. Well, let's discuss the wrong options here. <sighs> At least this one makes sense. If the population growth rates were high, then at least the population size would be growing rapidly, in which case you would get partial credit for that. Um, you would not get any credit for this because if population growth rates were high, then the population size would not be fairly stable, right? As we said up there, it would be growing rapidly. Um, this one at least makes sense too. If the population growth rates were low, then the population... Mm, actually, no, that wouldn't be correct either. If I'm thinking, if we're really nitpicky about the wording here, population growth rates are low. Not zero, not negative, but low. That would mean there's still the population would still be growing. It would still be increasing. Um, it would just be increasing um, slow, slowly. And, of course, the, the garbage one that I threw in there. It's hard to calculate because no one can count and most people can't see or here, right? Uh, that just makes no sense. I just threw that in there. So yeah, you definitely lost extra points if you chose that one. Next, a meteor strike that immediately kills a population of iguanas is an example of what? And the real, this question, you've seen different versions of it. Really, the only answers are, or the only real choices are, is it density dependent or density independent? And it is density independent, right? So a meteor strike it's just going to, let's just say, you know, whatever size meteor it was, let's just say it kills everything within one square mile. Well, if it's going to kill everything within a square mile, it doesn't matter if there's a thousand iguanas in the square mile or if there's two iguanas in a square mile. Either way, the meteor is going to kill 100% of the population. So, yes, the answer is density independent. And remember, the only choices, the only real choices are density independent or density de dependent. If you chose anything else, you got zero credit. At least if you chose density dependent, you at least got half credit. Biological control, zero credit. But hey, at least you're at least you're choosing a term from the same um, section of the semester. Uh, population momentum, eh, again, same same section of the semester. Ecological consortium, just something I made up. So really, if you chose that one, you're completely wrong. Anyway, moving forward, let's give you the next word for attendance, or not attendance, I'm just used to saying that, um, for the extra credit. The next word is basket. You know, like you might put Easter eggs in an Easter basket. Moving forward, a population of a typical species usually does what as time goes on? I thought this was going to be easy, but it, apparently it wasn't. The answer is fluctuates. Try to picture it in your mind. I wish I could draw it. There, it shows you shows the population increasing. Sorry, look to the left. You can see my cursor moving. Population slowly increasing, and then it hits carrying capacity, and it evens out, right? That's what I showed you for the growth models. But then I pointed out the growth models are just that. They're not models. They don't show exactly what happens. What actually happens is it hits carrying capacity, and it kind of fluctuates a little bit above and below, um, above and below carrying capacity. The most wrong answer, excuse me, the most common wrong answer I saw was boom and bust cycles. <clears throat> um, even though you didn't get any points for that, I, I like to think the reason you thought about that was because, again, as I'm describing this variation, like I said, it goes above and below the carrying capacity. Um, and if you're looking at a graph, I guess someone could argue that that looks a little bit like a boom and bust cycle because it's going up and down. The only difference is, it's just fluctuating slightly above and below the carrying capacity. Boom and bust is like 
huge population and then it crashes down to nearly zero and then huge and then crashes down to nearly zero. So if you chose boom and bust, you are incorrect and that's why you were incorrect. But like I said, um, at least give credit where credit's due. Well, not points credit, but verbally I'm telling you, I can see where you may have made that mistake. Anyway, moving forward. Think about opportunistic species. Which of the following is the best description? So basically this question is asking which of the following describes opportunistic species? Not very long living. Yes, that is correct. They do not live very long. Have a large number of offspring. That is actually also correct. Um, reach sexual maturity quickly. That's actually also correct. Exhibit type 2 survivorship. Incorrect. Exhibit artificial crossing over. That is some garbage that I made up. Ooh. Opportunistic. You know what? Here we go. This is going to be more pain. This is going to be more work for me. But here's a mistake I made. So all of these answers are correct. Opportunistic, short living, have a lot of offspring, and they reach sexual maturity quickly. So I've changed this <laughs> to include the other correct answers. Um, so now what I'm going to have to do is go back through everybody's grade and make sure that they got credit for that. So anyway, moving forward, you should know examples from density dependent, density and blah, blah, blah. blah. Again, this is another question about density dependent or independent. And this one's simply asking you. So the last one said, you know, hey, this is the thing that happened. Is it density dependent or density independent? This one's saying, hey, which one of these is density dependent? So it's sort of the same question, just asking it a different way. Anyway, which is the following is dependent? Torna again, tornado. No, that would just kill, again, uh, as an example, 100% of whatever's living in, I don't know, a quarter square mile, right? So it doesn't matter. It's just going to kill everything. Volcanic eruption. Again, it's just going to kill everything. Viral infection. There's the answer, right? Because if, think about COVID. If you have, you know, I don't know, out, out in Northern Alaska, if you have five humans for every 100 square miles versus downtown you know, New York City, where you have many, many more people just stacked upon each other, obviously the virus is going to, spread a lot quicker when the um, population density is high, right? So that would be density dependent. Flood, again, this is going to kill what it kills. Ionic polarization, just a word that I completely made up. So the answer again is viral infection. If you chose ionic polarization, you might consider retaking this course. It's just a word I made up, not even a real choice. Moving forward, integrated pest management, blank. Favors overwhelming a pest with chemical pesticides. No, that is not true. Advocates total eradication of pests. No, that is not true, right? Because it actually ad advocates um, tolerating a low level, right? Um, anyway, next. Aims to keep population <laughs> on an exponential growth curve. No, remember, because we, you might tolerate a few, but you don't want them to be, you know, the, the population to explode, right? That's not good. Um, here we go. Here's the correct answer. Advocates mixed species planting and rotating crops. And I've already explained why you would want to do that. I did it in the lecture and I did it for the final exam review. So I'm not going to do it again. Let me know if you have questions. The ecological footprint of the United States blanks is about the same as the global average. Nope. It's higher. It's lower than the global average. Definitely not. Like I just said, it's higher. Shows that Americans consume a disproportionate amount of food and fuel. That's the answer. Um, and the next shows that the population size is increasing slowly. That is not the answer. Simply put, the answer is this one, right? We, we, we use a lot of resources compared to the, um, the world average. Type one survivorship. Remember, type one, just think of humans. I mean, the, I mean, obviously it involves many more than just humans, but, or excuse me, many more species other than humans. But yes, it also includes humans. So anyway, type one survivorship curves are typical of species that exhibit what? Intermediate number? No. Anytime it's intermediate, you should think of type two. Few offspring, good parental care. Bing, bing, bing. That's the answer, right? Few offspring, good parental care. Many offspring and good parental care. That is not the case. Um, the good parental care part is, yes, but not the many offspring. Um, and then, of course, many offspring and poor parental care would be uh, type three. So there's the answer. A few offspring, good parental care. The next question. Blank is the maximum population size that a particular habitat can support. 
I was hoping this would be easy. The answer is carrying capacity. It's, it's, it's just that simple. Carrying capacity is the maximum population size the habitat can support. Um, population cycle is describing an event, right? Or events, if you will. So that's obviously not it. Um, life history pattern. No, again, that's just, uh, I don't have time to get on into all of these survivorship curve. Yeah, the answer is just simply carrying capacity. Um, yep. Which of these best describes type three survivorship? So again, just think the opposite of humans. Um, there's very high survivorship for the very young. No. Again, that was actually the biggest example I use for identifying a type three survivorship. Type three are the kind of things that throw out just a bunch of uncared for offspring. So think about a, a plant that has, you know, thousands of tiny little seeds, most of, most of which will not um, germinate and become plants. Or if you're talking about animals, think of frogs laying, you know, thousands of eggs, most of which won't hatch and become tadpoles and survive to become adult, um, to become frogs. So, so on and so forth. Um, so yeah, that's not the answer. Um, next, most individuals survive to older age individuals. Nope, that is also type one. Um, survivorship is constant over the lifespan. No, that is type two. Survivorship is high for the few individuals that survive to a certain age. That is the answer. Think of a sea turtle laying all those eggs and then they hatch all at once and you get all those little baby sea turtles, you know, rushing to get into the water. Most of them don't make it, but the ones that do, they survive. Um, they're more likely to survive. So anyway, that's the answer to that one. Next, in an ideal unlimited environment, what shape does the population's growth curve mostly, most closely resemble? I'm really sad that anybody got this wrong. This is verbatim from the study guide. Verbatim, the way we discussed it in the final exam review, I didn't change a thing, right? So unlimited environment, um, the answer is J. It's a J curve. I don't know how people miss this. Even more so, these two at the bottom are nonsense. This is nonsense. I pointed out the fact that this is nonsense when we had the final exam review. The only two real answers to choose from are S and J. So if you chose this, you're even more wrong, even though I gave you the answer in the exam review and discussed it at length. So anyway, if you chose J, you got one point instead of two. And if you chose any of these, you got zero points. All right. Moving forward, which of the following is the best description of a population? This should be easy. I was hoping this was easy. There was a little bit more, more wrong answers that I would hope for. Um, a group of organisms that occupies the same general area at different times. No, for many reasons. First of all, but I'll just stick with this part for now. Different times? No. If they're there at different times, then it doesn't matter, right? Because they're not they're not exposed to the same conditions. They're not um, competing for the same resources. Anyway, next, a group of individuals of a single species. Oh, there we go. That occupy the same general area at the same time. Yay, there's the answer. Um, next. Let's talk about these wrong answers. The growth rate of individuals of a single species that occupy the same general area at the same time. No, it's not the growth rate. Not at all. Um, and then the next, the growth rate of individuals of a single species, blah, blah, blah. So the answer is a group of individuals basically competing for the same resources, right? They're exposed to the same conditions because they're at the same place at the same time. If you chose the first one, you at least got partial credit. If you chose these two, you got zero credit because there's nothing to do with the growth rate. We're not talking about the growth rate, right? Now, populations do grow and shrink, so a growth rate is a discussion we would have about a population, but that is not a definition of a population. Moving forward. In most developing countries, blank. Um, so now we're not talking about developed countries like the United States of America. We're talking about developing countries. So think about poor, poorer countries. Um, birth rates equal death rates, so population is fairly stable. No, that would be developed countries. That would be like the United States, as we've already discussed. Birth rates are lower than death rates, so the population is declining. That is incorrect, but at least that would make sense. Um, if you had more people dying than being born, um, the population would decline, but that's not the case for developing countries. Uh, birth rates are lower than death rates. 
so the population is growing rapidly? No. Not only is that not the case, but that's not what would happen. If you had more, again, if you had more people dying than were being born, then the population would be shrinking, not growing, much less growing rapidly. And then finally, the birth rates are much higher than death rates. So the population is growing rapidly. That is the correct answer. Boom. That is the correct answer. Now, if you chose the top one, uh, birth rates equal death rates, but you would get partial credit. If you chose this one, birth rates are lower than death rates, so population is declining. You would get partial credit because, again, at least that makes sense. If you chose birth rates are lower than death rates, so the population is growing rapidly, you got zero points. You did not get any credit because that makes no sense. Moving forward, competition between organisms in the same species is what kind of competition? The key here is we're talking about the same species, not in between species. So it's simply intraspecific. Right. The answer is intraspecific. And really, the only option, because the only thing we discuss when we talk about competition, either between species or in the same species, it was either intraspecific or interspecific. The other stuff is just filler. So if you chose interspecific, you at least got one out of two points. If you chose anything else, you got zero points because that has nothing to do with this discussion. All right. How can non-native species have significant impacts on biological communities preying upon natives? Uh, the fact that each one said only and then one of them said all of these are correct. That was a big hint. Generally speaking, that's going to that's going to be the correct answer when you come across a question like this. Not always, but generally speaking. I don't even know if I want to say that. Just forget that just in case. Who knows? Anyway, let's discuss them. Um, yeah, sometimes um, non-native species do prey upon native species. Sometimes they do compete with native species for resources. Sometimes they do reduce biodiversity. So, yeah, the answer is all of the above. And we discussed why both during lecture and for the final exam review. So that is the answer. Um, let me double check and make sure I have it. Yep, that is correct. So I guess in this case, this is one of those few where, hey, if you got the wrong answer, at least you were not completely wrong, right? because they are all correct, but that's the most correct. Anyway, which of the following best describes type two? We've already discussed, excuse me, we have already discussed type one. We have already discussed type three. Type two is we're just right there in the middle. Um, high survivorship, no. Most individuals survive, most individuals survived older ages, no. Survivorship is constant, that's the answer. Um, survivorship is high, nah. So survivorship is constant over the lifespan, so that's the answer. Which of the following best describes a species that exhibits equilibrium life history? We've already discussed <clears throat> opportunistic life history. <clears throat> Excuse me. So now we're discussing the opposite, which is equilibrial life history. And that would be more like us, right? Humans, type one. So anyway, that being, that being said, with that in mind, let's look at the options. Have long lives? Yep, that's true. Exhibit type three survivorship? True. That is the opposite of true excuse me, exhibit a type three survivorship curve is the opposite of true. Exhibit a type two survivorship curve is inaccurate and have a large number of offspring. No, that is incorrect because that is a type three survivorship curve. So the answer is have long lives. Herbivory. I don't know why so many people miss this one. I was hoping it would be easy. That's why I threw it in there. <clears throat> and we talked about it for the exam review. Herbivory an example, is an example of what kind of interaction? Well, it helps the it helps the thing eating the plant and it hurts the plant. So the answer is plus minus. Plus minus is simply the answer. Um, yeah, there's no way around it. I guess I think the most common wrong answer was n negative. Or excuse me, yeah, neutral and positive. Um, I don't know why, but anyway, the answer is positive and negative. Right? Good for the thing eating the plant, bad for the plant. Generally speaking. Anyway, the most significant threat to biodiversity comes from which of the following? I uh, went over this in great detail. The answer is simply habitat destruction and, and fragmentation. And remember, like I said in the lecture, like I said for the exam review, the easy way to remember that is all the other three choices kind of contribute to this. Habitat destruction and fragmentation, right? So invasive species, that destroys habitats. Over-exploitation, like cutting down trees quicker than they can be um, you know, before quicker than they re reproduce, for an example, that would be habitat. Uh, that would be habitat destruction. Uh, pollution again destroys habitats. So I was hoping people would get that right. Some people did miss it. All right, so that's it for all the new material. So those are all the questions that covered chapters 
13, 19, and 20. And if I remember correctly, there was only about 36 questions from new material because we didn't get to finish it all. And I just thought it would be easier for you guys if we had more questions on old material. Not only because of the fact that it's old and you've been able to think about it longer and we've been able to talk about it longer, but the older material, again, came from the first three exam, first three exams verbatim. So the questions were not changed. I copied and pasted them. So you've seen these. All you had to do in, the, in this case is memorize them. That being said, let's jump into it. What keeps a single water molecule together? Very simple. The answer is covalent bonds. So the thing that's keeping the hydrogens connected to the oxygen is a covalent bond. It's that simple. Now, if you chose hydrogen bonds, I even gave you partial credit. Because actually, well, let me complete that thought. Because at least you're on the right track. Because yes, it's covalent bonds that keep a single water molecule together, the oxygens to the hydrogens, excuse me, the oxygen to the hydrogens. But at least in that discussion, we did talk about the fact that the thing that kept multiple water molecules connected to each other, that was hydrogen bonds, right? So you, you were on the right track with hydrogen bonds. I even gave you partial credit for choosing ionic bonds because at least that was one of the three types of bonds we chose. Polar bonds was something I made up. Now, we talked about polar molecules, which result in hydrogen bonds, but they were, we never talked about polar bonds. And then, of course, glue is something I completely made up. And I think somebody chose that. I hope not. But I really do think off the top of my head that somebody chose that. I don't know why, where you would get that idea. But anyway, the answer is covalent bonds. And if you chose any of these other uh, hydrogen or ionic bonds, you got partial credit. If you chose any of these two, you got zero credit moving forward cellulose is an example of what this is a simple i don't know there's not much to, to talk about here the answer is simply um a polysaccharide all right it's not a steroid that's a lipid at least monosaccharide you were on the same track because the monosaccharide is a carbohydrate so is cellulose hey that's something um and of course a polypeptide is simply a protein you know that just hasn't folded up yet necessarily Anyway, what is the name given to the reaction that breaks peptide bonds? The fact that it's a peptide bond doesn't even matter. Like I said during the final exam review, the fact that it's breaking a bond, that's what's important, and the answer is hydrolysis. Hydrolysis is, are the reactions that break bonds. Beryllium's atomic mass is nine. Its atomic number is four. How many neutrons are in the beryllium atom? Well, nine, the fact that its atomic number is four means that it has four protons. And the protons plus the neutrons equals the atomic mass. So really, what's the question asking? Four plus what equals nine? The answer is five. Four plus five equals nine. I even gave you partial credit if you chose four or nine. The only way you completely did not get any points is if you somehow chose 4.5. Because that we do not deal with decimals when we deal with how many neutrons and how many protons. Right? There is no decimals. It's just whole numbers. So the chances of you getting partial credit for this were, were three to four, right? Like just very. So if you got that one wrong, you got zero credit. Or excuse me, if you chose that wrong answer, the 4.5, you got zero credit. Which is these is in the correct order. I discussed this in the exam review. I, I understand that's a little bit tricky because it, the, usually when you look at the scientific method, you see the whole thing spelled out, like all the different um, steps. Uh, here, there's only a few of them, but you had to pick them in order. Observation, yep, that is the first step, which leads to a question, yep. Uh, and here's where it goes off the rails. The hypothesis comes before the prediction, because remember, you come up with one hypothesis, and then there's multiple predictions that you can come up with to test your hypothesis. So that's not the right answer. Experiment, obviously, that's not going to come first. Question, Granted, sometimes it does just start with a question, like in lab. In lab, you don't usually observe something. Usually, I just pose a question, and then in lab, you answer the question. So there we go. We're on the right track. Prediction? Yeah, there we go. I mean, we skipped some steps, but prediction does come after question. Conclusion? Ah, there you go. That is the right answer. Question, prediction, conclusion. Obviously, we skipped some steps, but it is in the correct order. Hypothesis, prediction, question. Again, this is just in the wrong order. Hypothesis does come from before the prediction but obviously the question comes first so the answer is simply question prediction conclusion moving forward you try to vacuum your room but your cordless vacuum won't turn on which of the following is a hypothesis many people got this wrong where at least if i remember correctly they at least got partial credit remember a hypothesis is a tentative answer to a question that you can actually test right it's something that has to be falsifiable 
So the answer is the battery isn't inserted properly, right? Because you could falsify that or you could prove that that is not correct. Um, so that is the correct answer. Why won't it turn on? That's a question. If I make it a wish, it will turn on. Uh, no, and let me come back to that. Let's skip down to this one. This is the most common wrong answer. If I reinsert the battery, it will turn on. No, that is a prediction. Because remember, a prediction is a statement. And as far as we were concerned in this course, it's an if-then statement uh, or an if statement based on the hypothesis. It's a, you have your hypothesis, and then you come up with different ways to test it with different pr um, predictions. So if you guess this, you at least got half credit. Because, yeah... It was a prediction and not a hypothesis, but at least it was a, a prediction based on the correct hypothesis. Um, if I make a wish, it will turn on. No, that is not. That would be a prediction, not a hypothesis, but also was not even related to the hypothesis. And then, of course, if you put I have such a bad luck, that's wrong, too. Yeah, it is a tentative answer to a question, but you can't test that. You can't falsify that. I can't prove that you, that you have that you don't have bad luck. Therefore, that's not a hypothesis. A fat that is completely hydrogenated would be what? This is one of those where a lot of people should have at least got partial credit for it because of the way I did the grading. Um, if it's hydrogenated, that means it has all the hydrogens it can, which means it's saturated, which means it's solid at room temperature. Now, if you – oh, sorry. Yeah, that's not one of those partial credit ones. So, yeah, you either got it right or you got it wrong. So that's the answer. Unsaturated, No. That would be incorrect. It's just saturated and solid at room temperature. And I've already talked about why that is the case, but contact me if you need me to explain it again. Which of these is hydrophilic? In other words, which thing kind of loves water, so to speak, um, dissolves in water, if you will? The answer is starch. Again, this goes back to these. One of these things is not like the other's questions, right? Cholesterol. <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> that's a lipid. Butter. That's a lipid. Testosterone, that's a lipid. So one of these things is not like the other. That is starch, which is a carbohydrate, which is hydrophilic. Next, blank is a steroid. I was hoping you would just know this because it's easy, because we talked about it. Estrogen is a steroid, all right? Um, maltose and sucrose are both, high, are both um, carbohydrates. At least butter is a lipid. And steroids are lipid, so I don't, in a sense, at least you were kind of on the right track, maybe, if you guess butter. But no, the answer is estrogen. What happens if you change the number of neutrons in an atom? This is, I was hoping, would be pretty simple. If you change the number of protons, you change the element. If you change the number of electrons, you create an ion. If you change the number of neutrons, you make an isotope. So the answer is you make an isotope, right? Different number of neutrons, you have an isotope. Nucleic acid, <laughs> nucleic acids are polymers of blank monomers. So what, basically, what monomers make up nucleic acids? Well, the answer is simply nucleotide. And look, this is one of those where you got partial credit, and it was really hard for you to guess the wrong one. I gave you partial credit if you guessed DNA or RNA, because at least DNA and RNA are nucleic acids, so you were kind of on the right track. Monosaccharides, well, that's a that's a carbohydrate, right? That's the monomer of a car, uh, carbohydrate. So you didn't get any, you got zero credit if you guessed that wrong. So even if you were guessing, you know, you had a one in four chance of guessing the wrong answer, completely wrong answer. So anyway, moving forward, which a fat contains which components? There's not much to say about this. The answer is simply it has three fatty acids and one glycerol molecule. As I said in the exam review, the way you could remember that is remember the other name for a fat, which is a triglyceride. Um, yeah, anyway, so triglyceride, so glycerol and three fatty acids. Moving forward, milk's pH is six. Which of the following is the correct statement? Well... If milk is six, we know water is seven. So that means we are one step down from seven, meaning, first of all, we're more acidic. We're not more basic. Remember, each step is a tenfold magnification. So therefore, there now we have now we have the information we need to answer this. Milk is ten times more acidic than water. It's just simply, it's that simple. Let's look at the other choices. Milk has ten times more OH ions than water. One second. Hey, cool. Thordabar. I'm going to complete my thought on this question and then I'll get to you. So, whoops. 
Um, yeah, so milk has 10 times more OH ions than water? No. At least the 10 times part was correct, but the reason the OH is incorrect is because that would make it more basic, and we know we are more acidic. Um, milk is 10 times more basic than water. That's basically what that option was, and again, that's why it's incorrect, and obviously none of these are correct is incorrect because milk is 10 times more acidic than water. So that is the answer to that. Now, really quickly, Thornabar, now that you're here, you can hear me, right? Yes. Perfect. All right. So what I'm doing is I'm just going through each one of these one by one, explaining why they're correct and why they're incorrect. Um, so what I'll do is I'll finish that. And as I'm doing it, if you have any questions about each specific um, question that we come to, then ask me. Otherwise, at the end, once I've gone through the entire final, then I'll ask you if you have any questions. Um, I will say this. When we're done here, you might want to go back and watch the first half of the video, watch the or watch the portion that you missed because I am going to give extra credit and I explain that in the video. Um, but I am the way the extra credit is based. It's based off of keywords like we do for um, attendance. So I'll go ahead and tell you right now. Actually, since you're live, I won't make you watch the video unless you want to. But the first word. Actually, no, I don't want to do that because I don't want to give this away for somebody watching the video. So, yeah, just watch the video to see what you missed. Um, but the word we're working with now that I'm about to give you right now is couch, like the thing that you sit on. Anyway, moving forward, this entire course is worth a thousand points. How much is independent work worth? I just chose that on random. Um, that question, the answer is a hundred points. It's that simple. There's nothing else to say about that. Uh, any, any questions about that? No. All right. What do you call a bond between oppositely charged atoms? That is simply an ionic bond. The way to remember that is because if they have a charge, then they're ionic, right? They're ions. Therefore, that must be an ionic bond. And just like the other question that I mentioned earlier that you missed, Thornabar, uh -huh. uh, at least if you guessed covalent bond or hydrogen bond, you at least got partial credit. You at least got one point, one out of two, because polar bond is not a thing. So the only people who got zero credit for this question are people who chose polar bond, because that is just something I made up. Not a thing. Um, and, and um, Thornabar, instead of, I'm not going to stop each time and ask you if you have a question. So okay. if, you, if you do have a question, just chime in. Okay. Uh, what type of fatty acid has double bonds? Simply unsaturated. Good, exactly. Unsaturated. Because if it was saturated, it would have all the hydrogen. Every single carbon would have as many hydrogens as it could bonded to it. Therefore, it couldn't double bond to another carbon. So, yeah, simple answer. An atom is basically defined by the number of protons. I mentioned that earlier in this video. Um, the number of neutrons, no. And if you change that number, that would be not, uh, an isotope. The charge, nah, again, you're kind of looking at ions there. Number of electrons, I don't know. At least you were maybe on the right track with that. Because generally speaking, unless we say it's charged, like in the lab, if we said it had eight protons, then unless it was charged, it also had eight electrons. So, eh. I guess you were kind of on the right track with that if you chose that. But, yeah, the answer is number of protons. Um, here we go. This question is asking what the products are. And the answer is simply the stuff on the right side, or the stuff that the answer point, or that the arrow points to. Um, so, in this case, the arrow points to water and sucrose. The answer is water and sucrose. Now, here's the catch, though. I made this worth two points because I at least gave you partial credit if you guess glucose and fructose. Because at least those two are the same. I mean, granted, they are reactants and not products, but at least they're on the same side of the equation. So if you chose, let's see, glucose and fructose, you got partial credit. If you chose fructose and water, you got zero credit because those are on opposite sides of the equation. If you chose glucose and sucrose, you got zero credit because those are on opposite sides of the equation. What happens when water freezes? Well, it floats. What causes things to float? Maybe it's because they become less dense. <clears throat> so what makes things less dense? That's when molecules move farther apart. So simply the answer is when molecules move farther apart. If they move closer together, that would make them more dense, which would make them make it sink. And that's not what happens with water. Uh, the hydrogen bonds become stronger. No, the hydrogen bonds certainly don't break. That's what happens when you boil water. Um, so, yeah, that's the answer to that. Here's one that someone sadly missed. What is biology? It is the scientific study of life. But hey, here's the good news. I made this one worth more. So even the person that missed it, who said the study of life, because that's probably what you grew up hearing, 
You at least got one point if you guessed study of life. If you guessed anything else, you got zero credit. But yes, the, the correct answer is biology is the scientific study of life. Which name is given this to given to this reaction? I won't even go through all the other words. The point here is that water is on the right side, or the arrow points to the water, meaning water is a product. Whenever water is a product, that means it is a dehydration reaction. So, at, or if you want to get a little bit more technical, and this would be a harder way of remembering it, but if you happen to remember that glucose, or excuse me, galactose is a monomer, glucose is a monomer, and lactose, or excuse me, let's say monosaccharide, monosaccharide, and disaccharide. So if you happen to remember all that, then you would know that this is a reaction that's building something as opposed to breaking it. That's another way of remembering it's a dehydration reaction. But the real only choices here are dehydration or hydrolysis. So even if you guess hydrolysis, you at least got partial credit because polymer and protein have nothing to do with this question. So if you guess those, zero credit. All right, this should be pretty straightforward. Photosynthesis, which produces oxygen. Well, remember, oxygen, water, electrons, is all go together in this exam. Um, so it is the water that gives up the electrons that becomes, that produces the oxygen. And where does that happen? That happens in the light reactions. So the answer is simply light reactions. But hey, here's where you get people got a lot of extra points here. As long as you chose something that had to do with photosynthesis, you at least got partial credit. So full credit for light reactions, half credit for Calvin cycle, and zero credit for anything else because anything else has nothing to do with photosynthesis. Same with here. Which uses water? Well, I just kind of really discussed it right there because the water gives up the electrons and that's what the thing that produces the oxygen. But the answer is light reactions. And again, partial credit for Calvin cycle, zero credit for anything else. Which produces glucose? Well, like I tried to describe in the lecture, it's the Calvin cycle. That's the factory. That's the thing that's using the ATP and using the high energy electrons and using all the carbon to produce glucose. So the answer is Calvin cycle. Partial credit for light reactions, zero credit for anything else. Which directly uses chlorophyll? Chlorophyll is a pigment. Pigments are things that absorb light. Light reaction. The answer is light reactions. Full credit for light reactions, partial credit for Calvin cycle, zero credit for anything else. Which produces high energy electrons? Not uses them, produces them. Well, photons are the things that we use to excite the electrons. Photons are type is from light, so it's light reactions. Partial full credit for light reactions, partial credit for Calvin cycle, zero credit for anything else. Respiration, which one produces the most ATP? Simply the electron transport chain. And this is going to come back into play a little bit later, but the other two are basically there to strip away high energy electrons. And then the electron transport chain uses those high energy electrons to produce a bunch of ATP. Which directly produces water? Well, electrons have to go somewhere. It's the water that, excuse me, it's the oxygen that absorbs them which then produces, well, I don't want to use the word absorbs, accepts, the oxygen accepts the water with some other stuff. Excuse me, the oxygen accepts the electrons with some other stuff that produces water. The answer is simply electron transport chain. Which directly produces carbon dioxide? That sees the hint. And the answer is citric acid cycle. Anything with carbon, whether it's photosynthesis or respiration, whether you're using carbon dioxide or producing it, is going to be some sort of cycle. So citric acid cycle for respiration, Calvin cycle for photosynthesis. Blank happens in chloroplasts while blank happens in the mitochondria. I was hoping this would be easy off the top of my head. I think it was. I think most people got this right. Photosynthesis happens in chloroplast. Respiration happens in the mitochondria. Respiration, which one strip away, or which strip away high energy electrons? I already said that a few minutes ago, a few seconds ago. The other two, right? Glycolysis and citric acid cycle strip away high energy electrons so that the electron transport chain can use them. So full credit if you got glycolysis and citric acid cycle. Partial credit if you got glycolysis only or citric acid cycle only. At least you were on the right track. Respiration, which uses high energy electrons. <laughs> so that goes along with this, right? Which strips away the high energy electrons? Those two. Which uses those high, high energy electrons? Well, the only one left, which is electron transport chain um so yeah so yeah i couldn't give you partial credit for that because it's that's just the answer 
Uh, respiration, which is or are associated with acidic acid and acetyl CoA? The answer is simply citric acid cycle. However, again, I made this one worth extra points because if you guessed glycolysis and citric acid cycle or glycolysis, I gave you partial credit. The reason being is because when we talked about acidic acid and acetyl CoA, that was that point that was where we took the. Remember, the pyruvate was the product of. Uh, glycolysis and that pyruvate was not ready to go into the citric acid cycle so we had to do all this other stuff you know that involved the acidic acid and the acetyl coa so you at least got partial credit if you got those other two <coughs> excuse me moving forward respiration which pumps hydrogen ions against the concentration concentration gradient simply the answer is the electron transport chain full credit for that Partial credit if you guessed anything to do with electron transport chain other than the question that or the option that lists all of them. Respiration, which one produces pyruvate? Well, glycolysis is the only thing that produces pyruvate, but as long as your answer <laughs> included glycolysis and it wasn't the one that lists all of them, you got partial credit. So full credit for the correct answer, partial credit if it involved uh, partially the correct answer. Respiration, which one happens in the mitochondria? Glycolysis is the only one that happens in the mitochondria. Again, whoa. Oh, excuse me. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I said that too quickly, and I read it and didn't think about it. What I said was the opposite. It is true. It's not what occurs outside of the mitochondria, because I think that's what the original study guide said. It is what happens inside the mitochondria. And citric acid cycle and electro, electron transport chain are the things that happen inside the mitochondria. So, again, two points for that. One point if you just guessed one or the other. So a lot of people got a lot of extra points in this section because at least if you were partially correct, you got you got some points. Anyway, respiration, which uses ATP synthase. Well, the only one that we really talked about using an enzyme, well, the where we named the enzyme, which is ATP synthase, was electron transport chain. Again, full credit for the correct answer. Partial credit if it involved electron transport chain with some other answers. All right. In respiration, high energy electrons come from glucose and that is ultimately and those electrons are ultimately accepted by oxygen. And then that forms a molecule of water. So that is the answer. Um, so you would put a glucose, B oxygen, C water. Um, I should have made. Yeah, that was worth three points, obviously, because. At least if you got one, you know, if you got one right, you got one point, two right, you got two points. Um, sadly, if you guessed ATP or carbon dioxide, you were way off because those are not, have nothing to do with that discussion. All right. And so the respiration, how many ATP are produced? The answer is 32. Um, and again, just because I wanted to help people get a decent grade, the answer is 32, and that was worth two points. But if you guessed 42, which is close, you got one point. And if you guessed 22, that is also re relatively close. So you got one point. So as long as you didn't, as long as you guessed 32, 22, or 42, you got some points. Anything else, you got zero points. The absence of a terminator will result in what? Now, a terminator is the thing that says, hey, we are done. This is the end of the gene. This is where you need to stop reading the code on the DNA. This is where we are done making the RNA. So if you didn't have a terminator, you would have a longer strand of RNA. So that is the answer. However, at least if you understand that a terminator stops something, then you might guess. Uh, no, no, sorry. I made this one even easier. You got partial credit. If I remember correctly, if it was anything other than Skynet, because Skynet is just a word I made up from the movie Terminator. I didn't make it up. Skynet is a word from the movie Terminator. So if you guessed anything else, you got partial credit as long as you didn't guess Skynet. Um, anyway, moving forward. Um, where does transcription start? The simple answer is promoter. That is where transcription starts. That is the place on the DNA where the RNA polymerase attaches. That is where transcription starts. If you guessed start codon, you got partial credit because at least then you realize where it's the, that's where a 
of all the processes that we talked about, something does start at the start code on. It's trans translation, not transcription. But again, at least uh, at least you're on the right track, so you got partial credit for that. Um, I really hope you didn't put metaphase or yes, that was actually the most common wrong answer. Was metaphase? No, we're entirely nothing to do with that. Metaphase is not a place, right? The promoter is a spot. It's on the DNA. Metaphase is an it's a, a phase, right? It's, a, it's an action. It's an event. Anyway, after replication, um, each new DNA strand consists of one old strand. Excuse me. Each new DNA double helix consists of an old strand and a new strand. That is the correct answer. You get the full two points. Again, I was being very liberal with the points here. As long as you didn't guess the one where I made up some junk, which is this one, you got partial credit. So if you guess this, this, or this, you got one point. If you guessed each new DNA double helix consists of mitochondria and protons, which makes absolutely no sense. Those words don't go together. You know, you should be okay. This is the only choice. They got zero credit. Moving forward, homologous chromosomes include only the autosomes. No. Carry genes controlling the same inherited characteristics. Yes. Carry the same versions of all genes. No. Remember, you have one version from your mom, one version from your dad. Um, at least if you're heterozygous, uh, conform to the rules of misbaventation. That is a word I made up. Um, so that's definitely not the right answer. And then, of course, our set of chromosomes that the cell receives from one parent. No, if you're homo homologous chromosomes, obviously that's uh, you're getting one from each. It's the set that you get from each. But again, partial credit, as long as you didn't guess this one that I completely made up, conform to the rules of misbaventation. Um, that is something I made up, and you will get zero credit for that. Partial credit for any other wrong answer. Blank is most commonly found in nature. The answer is simply the wild type. You did get partial credit if you guessed dominant trait or recessive trait, because that is at least a trait that we talked about in this discussion. Ionic chromatid is a word that I made up. Naughty by nature is a hip-hop uh, group from the 80s and 90s. So obviously very wrong. So again, partial credit if you guess something that have to do with the trait, which is in the correct order. Simply put, the answer is DNA to RNA to protein. Full credit for that. Partial credit if you anything was, uh, at least part of it was in the correct order. Um, so DNA to RNA. Hey, that part's right. So you got partial credit for that, if I remember correctly. Um, no, not there. RNA to protein. No, no, no. Anyway, yeah, so you got partial credit for that one. Um, picture a double helix of DNA. What's holding those two strands together? So, again, we're talking about the two strands. We're not talking about that um, sugar phosphate backbone that holds a single strand of DNA together, the thing that holds each nucleotide together. That would be covalent bonds. So the answer is hydrogen bonds. Now, if you guessed covalent bonds, you got partial credit because at least a covalent bond does hold a single strand of DNA together. Somebody guessed cellular glue and it made me want to cry. What? We never said anything about cellular glue. And this is a question from an exam that you had earlier. So you should have known from way back when that that was a, uh, a wrong answer. Um, sorry, I'm going to just check back. Okay. Moving forward. Which enzyme did we discuss being used during S phase? Simply put, the only one that we discussed being used in S phase was DNA polymerase, because S phase is where DNA is duplicated. The only time that happens, or excuse me, the, um, the enzyme that does that is DNA polymerase. Remember, enzymes are named after what they do, and this thing makes a polymer of DNA. Um, you did get partial credit if you talked about RNA polymerase. Yeah. Because at least that was something that we talked about, right? So we talked a great deal about DNA polymerase and RNA polymerase. So I can see how you would make that mistake. If you chose anything else, you got zero credit. Chromatin consists of DNA and protein. It's that simple. Um, again, that's worth double the points because at least if you guessed RNA and protein, you got partial points because eh, at least that's a nucleic acid and a protein. So you're on the right track. Lipid and protein, no. Meiosis and protein, definitely not, because meiosis is not a thing, right? Or meiosis is an event, right? It's uh, stages. It's when cells split. So, no, definitely not. Likewise, this is just as 
just as equally as wrong. Mitosis and protein, completely off the wall. All right. So here we're looking at anaphase one versus anaphase, excuse me, anaphase one versus anaphase and mitosis. So the key here is we're dealing with homologous chromosomes versus sister chromatids. So with that being said, and also, again, we're dealing with anaphase. Remember, anaphase is when they separate. So the answer is homologous chrom chromosomes separate versus when sister chromatids separate. Full credit for that. Partial credit, at least if you are on the, uh, no, let me, if I remember correctly, I think you got partial credit if you guessed anything other than this last one that I completely made up. RNA codifies and DNA codifies. Those are just words I made up. So as long as you guess something, if I remember correctly, you got partial credit. Um, middle cells, there's a new cell. At the very least, you got partial credit for this one because here you're at least dealing with homologous chromosomes for anaphase one and sister chromatids for, anaf uh, for anaphase and mitosis. So you're really on the right track there. You just should have chose, you know, this would be more of uh, metaphase and anaphase, but at least you are on the right track with that one. So moving forward, um, the next word for this extra credit is going to be grass. Like the thing, the stuff growing on your front lawn, the green plant, grass. All right, which enzyme is used in transcription? Well, what is transcription? Transcription is when we read the DNA code to make a strand of RNA. So we're making an RNA polymer. Enzymes are named after what they do or their substrate. So here we are. RNA polymerase is the answer because we're making RNA. That being said, if you guessed DNA polymerase, you got partial credit because like I just said, and like I've been saying all semester, enzymes are named after what they do or the substrate they work on. So some could argue simply by that logic, someone might say, well, RNA polymerase, the substrate it works on, you know, it reads the code on the DNA, in which case, hey, good, good argument. Wrong answer, but good argument. Um, so anyway, you would get partial credit for that. Mendel's law of segregation basically says what? Um, and the answer is only one allele for a given gene segregates into each gamete. Meaning if you were to look at any given sperm or egg, right? You don't have the full homologous, the, the full set of homologous chromosomes. You only have one or the other, right? You only have one allele or the other. So again, this one's worth extra points. Let's talk about the other partial credit. Zygotes are haploid. That is an incorrect statement. That would get you zero credit. Two alleles segregate into each gamete. Uh, that is an incorrect statement too. Um, matter of fact, that's the opposite is true. That's the opposite of the correct answer. It is the concentration of hydrogen atoms in the mitochondria that allows the electron transport chain to produce ATP. All right, so that that, that kicked kick started my memory. Now I remember what I was going to say. As long as you didn't guess that one, or let's see, steroids are a category of lipids, which is a correct statement, but it has nothing to do with this. As long as you didn't guess those two, you actually got partial credit because at least you were discussing something that's in this in the same topic. Um, so moving forward. All right, so this question is basically asking. All of these things are needed for translation. All of these parts are needed for translation except what? And the answer is DNA. DNA is not directly needed for translation. Now, granted, in, in cells, as opposed to this um, hypothetical situation we set up up here, in cells, the DNA provides the code that is used to make the mRNA. So, yeah, in a cell, you wouldn't have the mRNA without the DNA. But DNA is not directly used in translation, so that is the correct answer. Uh, what would happen in, <clears throat> if a cell completed the cell cycle without undergoing a cytokinesis? Meaning, it went if it completed the cell cycle, that means it also went through mitosis. Meaning, the chromosomes have been duplicated, they've been split, the nucleus is split and been reformed. Meaning, now at this point, you have two nuclei because if it hasn't gone undergone cytokinesis, that means the cell itself hasn't split. So let's look at the choices. It would not have completed anaphase. No, I just said that it completed the cell cycle. It would only have one nuclei? No, because again, mitosis splits the nuclei and then you end up with two. Enters cell catharsis? No, that's some garbage that I made up. Um, has more genetic material than it started with? There's the answer. And then finally, its chromosomes will be lined up in the middle of the cell. Again, no, 
because that would mean it would be stuck in metaphase. And I just said it completed the cell cycle. But here's the good news. As long as you didn't guess this one that I completely made up, you got partial credit. So if you chose intercell catharsis, which is some garbage that I made up, you got zero credit. Anything else would have gotten you partial credit. All right. Marfarin syndrome. Um, it's a type of what? It's what type of inheritance? Now, in the lecture, when we talked about Marfarin syndrome, I did tell you this is just an example and you do not need to memorize this or any example. But I did say what you need to recognize is the fact that you have one allele, right? One gene um, that results in a multitude of symptoms, right? So yeah, Marfan syndrome, they've got, they're tall, they're lanky, they have heart problems, they have all, eye problems, all this from this one allele. And that should tell you that the answer is pleiotropy. So one allele, you know, and then many different traits. Um, now, again, I'm just trying to give away points here. If you guessed, whoops, pleiotropy, obviously you got full credit. Um, perfunctual, per wait, perfunctional. That's a word that I made up. So if you guessed co-dominance or incomplete dominance, you got partial credit because that is in the discussion we were having because we were talking, you know, all these things are, were compared and contrast. Co-dominance, incomplete dominance, complete dominance, pleiotropy, um, polygenic inheritance. These are all things we talked about in the same conversation. The top one is a word I made up and heterozygous recessive is not a thing because remember heterozygous would be both dominant and recessive and it has nothing to do with that discussion. So again, partial credit if you got something along the right lines, zero credit if you guessed perfunctional or heterozygous recessive. In the human life cycle, fertilization produces a diploid zygote. It's that simple. But again, I'm giving away points here. So let's look at the other options. Chloroplast cycles between ATP and sugar has nothing to do with this discussion. And it's a sentence that makes no sense anyway. What? That may, right? That, that makes no sense. Uh, meiosis produces a haploid zygote. You got partial credit for that because meiosis does produce haploid cells, not zygotes, but it does produce haploid cells. So boom, partial credit. Meiosis produces diploid sperm and egg cells. Again, partial credit. Because meiosis does produce sperm and egg cells. They're not diploid, but they are sperm and egg cells. So you got partial credit. A haploid zygote undergoes mitosis to produce an adult human. Partial credit. Because the zygote is not haploid, but a zygote does undergo mitosis to produce an adult human. All right. RNA. Which RNA brings amino acids to the ribosomes? And the hint that I gave in the lecture and in the final exam review was that this word brings. I had to use the word brings because if I use the other word, it would give it away. Which type of RNA transfers um, amino acids to the ribosomes? And the answer is tRNA. And here we go, giving away more points. The only RNA we discussed was tRNA mRNA and rnRNA. So if you guessed the wrong answer, but it was one that we discussed, you got partial credit. If you guessed pDNA, which is something I made up, or siRNA, which is a real thing, but we didn't discuss it, you guessed those two, you got zero credit. All right. Men they'll cross some flowers, right? Purebred purple, purebred white, all of the offspring, aka the F1 generation, they're all purple. Why? Right? What's the situation here? Well, all the offspring, first of all, you should know that they're heterozygotes because if you have homozygous dominant crossed with a homozygous recessive, then 100% of your offspring are going to be heterozygotes. So that's the answer to that part. And if they're all and if they're all purple, then that must mean purple is dominant to white. So the correct answer is heterozygotes and dominant. And here we go. I'm giving away more more points here. If you guessed anything other than this one that makes no sense, which is autosomes and diploid, then you got partial credit. Wait, hold on. Let me think. I'm trying to remember how I did that. Uh, homozygous zone. Hmm. Heterozygous. No, I'm sorry. If you guessed heterozygotes and recessive, you got partial credit because they are heterozygous. Um, if you guessed homozygous and dominant, 
you got that partially. You got partial credit for that because the purple is dominant. So as long as you didn't guess autosomes and diploid and homozygous recessive, then you got partial credit. All right. Um, what would a mutation that results in insertion of a premature stop codon do? I love this because it requires you to know what a stop codon is and, you know, what it does. Um, a stop codon, right, that's that code on the RNA that says, all right, we're done with translation, meaning we're done building this, we're done adding a bunch of amino acids together to make a polypeptide, to make a protein, right? So with that knowledge in mind, let's look at the choices. Results in a shorter strand of monosaccharides. No, we're not talking about carbohydrates here. We're talking about um, making a strand of of uh, amino acids, right? A polypeptide, a protein. Results in a, st a shorter strand of RNA. Nah, but at least RNA is in the discussion. Results, uh, results in a shorter strain of DNA. No, but again, at least DNA is sort of in the discussion, a little bit farther removed than RNA. Results in a shorter strand of pyruvates. Way, way, way off. What? No. That's something we, that was a discussion of how pyruvates was in the uh, respiration discussion. Uh, results in a shorter strand of amino acids. That is the correct answer. Results in a shorter strand of amino acids. But partial credit, at least if you guess shorter strand of RNA or DNA, because again, at least that's in the same discussion. Pyruvates, first of all, we never even talked about strands of pyruvates. And second of all, pyruvates have nothing to do with this discussion, not even that same exam. Um, and then, of course, same thing with monosaccharides. So, yeah, partial credit if you got anything to do with RNA or DNA. All right, a purebred zingleflinger, which is a species that I just made up, produces a blue cloud when it farts, and it's crossed with a purebred one that produces a yellow cloud when it farts. So the farts of all the offspring are green. Why? Well, if you mix blue and yellow, you get green. That would be an example of incomplete dominance. If it was co-dominant, you would have both. You would have blue and green. But here we're talking about the mixing. Just like in the lecture when we talked about a red flower and a white flower make a pink flower. That is incomplete dominance. Now, if you had a red flower and a white flower and you mix them and then you got a red flower with white spots, that would be co-dominant. That being said, I understand those two are easy to confuse. Oops. So if you guess the alleles are co-dominant, you got partial credit. Even if you guess the allele, the green allele is dominant to the blue allele, you even got partial credit for that. Even though I never said anything about a green allele, at least green did come out on top. So your logic was partially correct, and you got partial credit for that. Um yeah, yeah, so that's, yeah, that's that. If I remember correctly, I may have given you partial credit for anything other than this one, which is the offspring represent the F2 generation of independent variation. First of all, the offspring represent the F1 generation. And second of all, there is no F1 or F2 or P generation of independent variation. These two, they don't go together in a sentence like that. So zero credit for that. What happens in transcription? Put it in order. The answer is simply initiation, elongation, termination. Anything else would be completely wrong. The most incorrect, or the most common incorrect answer, sadly, was this one, G1, G2, and S. First of all, that's not even in this discussion. Um, and second of all, it's not even in the correct order because it goes G1, S, and then G2. So I should have made that worth more points and had that, um, you know, be worth zero points. Oh, or this, hydrolysis, citric acid cycle, and electron transport chain. These two, well, none of this has to do with this discussion. Hydrolysis doesn't even belong in the same discussion, in the same list as citric acid cycle and electron transport chain. Procrastination, insulation, and fermentation, those have nothing to do with each other. They just all ended in Asian, so I put them in there. Elongation, continuation, and termination. Sadly, I don't think anyone even guessed that. At least if you guessed that, mm, I mean, at least that logically makes sense, right? right? It's getting elongated, and then it keeps getting elongated, and finally it stops. Plus, it actually involves one of the correct terms. But anyway, so that's the answer. Uh, initiation, elongation, termination. This is, And that's why the other ones are incorrect. All right, here's the most, here's a very a commonly missed question. It was missed the first time on the exam. 
the first exam and now it was missed again because people, I mean, I, I can understand what they're thinking. Anyway, this question does not ask you to put the, the phases of mitosis in order. Otherwise, the correct answer would be prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. This asks you what happens in each phase and which phase, phase do the sister chromatids separate? And that is anaphase. And this is the only one that starts in anaphase. So if you're in a time crunch, you could have just chosen that answer and been correct. So the answer, the correct answer is anaphase, metaphase, prophase, telophase. If you guessed prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, I gave you partial credit because I know you probably, at least I, I think I know what you were thinking, which was what are the what are the orders or what are the phases in order? That's probably what you were thinking, and in which case you are correct. If you guess these other ones, those have nothing. First of all, they're not in the correct order, and second of all, they don't describe what's happening here. And again, if you chose this one, you definitely got zero points. Because there is no G3 phase. And again, the prop order would be G1, S, and then G2. So anyway, moving forward. Oh, last question. A duplicated chromosome consists of two what? And the answer is simply chromatids. However, partial credit was given for chromosomes because those are very similar. And I probably even slipped up and said chromosomes in a lecture when I meant to say chromatids. I would like to think I corrected myself immediately, but because of that, again, partial credit for chromosomes, zero credit for anything else, especially polyphenols. It's nothing to do with this discussion. So that is it. That is the entire um, final exam. I've gone through every single question because again, I'm not here to teach how to take an exam and I know all the grades are done and over with, but hopefully you're here to learn as I can tell Thornabar is. So. Do you have any questions about anything, Thornabar, before we uh, finish this last video ever for the for the semester? <laughs> no, sir. You did well. So did you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and that being said, I guess before we log off, obviously, like I just said, the semester's over. So as far as grades are concerned, there's nothing else to talk about. But, you know, I teach biology. I'm always here to teach biology. So I don't care if it's 10 years from now. And you're just having a conversation from with a friend and you're just trying to remember something you learned in biology and you can't remember contact me i'm always here to teach biology okay. or for that matter i'm also here to help you graduate so if you need help with any other subject that has nothing to do with biology you could ask me i might not know the answer but i'd be glad to try to help you whatever it takes to get you to graduate right i think i made it i'm i have my cap and gown and tickets for tomorrow morning yeah that's great i'll see you tomorrow morning i'll be there okay thank you you're welcome. Have Bye -bye. a good one. You too.